Hello everybody. Hello vinyl community. So I haven't done a VC oriented video for quite a long time and um, that's just life. I mean sometimes um, you just don't have the, the energy or just don't feel like it. Um, and I see it happen all the time uh, with other vinyl community video creators. Um, Particularly two of them I kind of miss right now, actually. Um, so one of them would be uh, the, the Liner Notes channel run by Bobby. He hasn't done a video for like two months. Um, the other one most certainly would be uh, the, the, video, the channel by Big Star 1000. It's kind of completely gone. Um, so, but uh, it's what it is, you know. I can certainly sympathize that sometimes... Um, you just don't feel like it, despite the fact that uh, a constant uh, production of videos and a uh, continuity on a daily basis is supposed to be the, the formula for success. But then again, what kind of success? I was never doing this for any kind of success. So I really don't mind to um, take uh, the back seat for a month or two. Uh, just uh, until uh, I just find the motivation uh, to do it. Um, it certainly has to do with the fact that um, myself, I'm a bit within a certain transformation. I'm transforming myself. Mm. <clears throat> no, I'm, I'm not uh, trying to become a woman, although I can see the advantages of that. But um, no, it's something else. I mean, I will be actually 50 in a few days. And uh, for the last few years, I've been quite riddled with uh, back pain and all kind of uh, unhealthy feelings that mostly had to do with the fact that, um, that my entire life I've tried to live rather bohemic and, uh, well, to some extent even nihilistic and um, that's how I kind of saw myself. I always saw myself as this guy that just spends the whole day sitting uh, uh, in, a, in a cafe somewhere and reading a book and reading newspapers and ordering one latte macchiato after the other, talking with people and basically doing nothing <laughs> useful and I never had a problem with that kind of image. But uh, then you kind of enter your late 40s and uh, realize that you could never suffer through more than one hour on some bad wooden chair in some shabby cafe <laughs> and that your body just seems to give up. And um, so I just realized I have to change everything. And this is something I have done for the last five, six months. And uh, it was not easy, but it was not easy for a different uh, reason. It was not easy because um, despite the fact that I had a very clear road in front of me and uh, basically had no real excuses, uh, um, suddenly there were quite a lot of uh, burdens, a lot of barricades thrown, a lot of rocks thrown uh, on the road in front of me. We had a rather harsh winter. Um, we had now many months of uh, quite a strict uh, corona-related lockdown, uh, which means all the gyms are closed here since uh, well, since uh, last uh, since the last autumn, basically. And um, also, I am taking care of my highly demented father and his far too big dog, and so it's a whole whole bunch of uh, complications in my life that uh, were running a lot of interference uh, for my uh, task or for my mission. But anyway, I managed to lose over, over 50 pounds in the last six months. Um, I have decided to... Because the, here's the thing, I'm not the type of guy that will draw any kind of satisfaction uh, from uh, just uh, lifting dumbbells all the day. While I'm fully aware of the fact that it's generally good for me and it's what I'm doing. I kind of need a, some kind of a higher purpose in that. So um, so if I ever start to go 
to gyms on a regular basis, uh, it will always be something I do for a particular reason that lies beyond that gym. Just to go to the gym, just to, uh, I don't know, watch my biceps growing um, in the mirror, this is just not my thing. So uh, I, had, uh, <laughs> I had made the rather outlandish decision um, to become a free climber. And uh, which, is a, which is a kind of a funny thing or humorous thing because when I started this or when I decided that I still, I still, I still had a weight of probably 250 pounds which is like um, by free climbing standards it's kind of like 100 too much. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's really not in the cards if you weigh like that. Um, but I thought this is kind of the this is kind of the, the the holy grail at the end of the road. This is something where it makes sense if you kind of um, go through all that pain of uh, of uh, doing all this uh, athletic calisthenics to yourself and all this exercise that I've hated so much my entire life. Um, but I tell you something: what I hate much more is like having back pain, back pain episodes that I had for the last three or four years. I mean, really awful, debilitating stuff. Where it just, when it starts on day one, you know, this would take like three, four days to get out of it, and you can't, you can't be very productive in those four days. I mean, you, um, you are basically in a very foul mood, obviously. Somehow trying to throw off that beast on your shoulder again. Um, so um, that's uh, that's what motivated me that I realized that this is no way to live. And I'm not the, I'm not the guy to become a typical middle aged pill popping person going to the doctor and begging him just to give you something. Particularly because I have no I have no chronical ailment or something. I was, I'm just a lazy. MF, so to speak, you know. So, um, yeah, so um, I decided uh, that this is actually something that, as a as a sport, it has always fascinated me. Um, this is probably the only form of sport that I ever found interesting as, a, as an observer, uh, with all the kind of a culture behind it, and uh, it's something that is somewhat connected to my childhood, etc., and um, so um, I thought, yeah, let's start with that. This will be an interesting journey. And as I said, I, I could have lost more weight. Um, I lost, uh, so I started with this, I was something above 120 kilogram, which is something over 250 pounds, I think. And uh, yeah, I managed to squeeze that down to... to um, well, to 95, uh, well, 94, actually, and um, that's, a, that's a huge improvement. It's still like 20 pounds too much for any kind of a serious climbing. Um, I mean, real pro climbers, which I'm too old, to, I mean, this is just, this is a game for 21-year-old kids. I mean, honestly, if, if we're talking about kind of athletic peaks, um, I'm just, I'm just old granddaddy that's, trying to squeeze himself into a scene that he probably doesn't belong to. But anyway, um, still this is a... I mean, if you, can, if you want to achieve any kind of serious results, you need to get, like, seriously under, under 85 kilogram. Ideally under 80. But the other problem is I'm 191 centimeters high, or tall, um, and that is, um, don't ask me what that is in, in feet, inches, and this crazy American way to measure things. I mean, no one here in Europe understands that. So, uh, but let's say 191 puts you kind of in the top 10% of tall people. So um, I can't go down to 70 kilogram um, like a lot of professional climbers do because if I, with my height, if I weigh 70 kilogram, I look like I'm coming from a kind of a Soviet Union uh, gulag after five years or something. So that's, that's not possible. But um, anyway, I spent, uh, because it was a bit frustrating, um, and that's why I'm telling this, is why I haven't made any VC videos and stuff like that, any YouTube videos at all, almost. Um, yeah, because uh, it was rather frustrating because I just 
oftentimes I couldn't do what I wanted to do, so I was kind of forced to train at home, and which is kind of boring, honestly. And uh, so I started to build a bouldering wall, which was a nice project for someone who never held a drill in his hand before. But uh, I kind of started to learn. So um, as far as timber and wood goes, I'm actually quite good with drilling now and uh, kind of screwing, uh, screwing um, logs together and stuff like that. So I've built a quite, quite, a, quite a big bouldering wall, which is like um, uh, two meters wide and three meters high. So, we, so it's over one meter higher than myself. So this is... Uh, place uh, where you can uh, easily put somewhere between 100 and 150 holds to train. Um, so that's kind of nice. So this certainly gave me another advantage um, and uh, just brought me a little closer to my aim. Despite the fact that everything is still locked down here, everything is closed, the gyms, the bouldering holes, everything is kind of unapproachable for me. So I have to make do. Nevertheless, um, it may be the new me, but uh, it's the old me as far as music goes. Um, so all the time I've actually been listening to a lot of music. And uh, that's obviously why I'm making this video. And uh, let's uh, have a look at my latest stack here. So some stuff I've been uh, listening to in the last two or three weeks. And uh, let's just check it out and talk about it a little bit. Now, uh, the first one here, um, what a beautiful treat. Um, this is uh, the album King Kong by uh, Jean-Luc Ponty. And um, Jean-Luc Ponty was, I think at that time, uh, playing uh, in Frank Zappa's band. And uh, obviously the full title of this uh, album is King Kong. Jean-Luc Ponty plays the music of Frank Zappa. And... Um, this is uh, a rearrangement of uh, some of the more jazzy or orchestral compositions that Frank Zappa had released up until that point of time. So there's some stuff from his solo records and some stuff from the Mothers. And um, so this is from 1970. And there's actually one track here that is called How Would You Like To Have A Head Like That? That is... It's the only track on this album not written by Frank Zappa, it's written by Jean-Luc Ponty. But it has uh, Frank Zappa playing guitar uh, here. So um, that's kind of nice. Um, it's certainly not a project where Zappa would be completely absent from it. Um, so this is, uh, this is an album that had his full approval. And uh, I think he was actually quite present during the arrangement. Particularly because... Um, Jean-Luc Ponty chooses some orchestral uh, expressionistic material here, particularly the, this giant suite uh, music for electric violin and low budget orchestra, um, which uh, is like 20 minutes long. So um, overall, this album is really the highest form of flattery and I'm pretty sure that uh, Frank Zappa was quite happy with it. At least that's what I tend to believe. Um, and it's a very pleasant listen. On the one hand, it has this uh, rather um, sort of a lofty fusion fusion feel to it, um, which is very pleasant to listen. <coughs> and um, the other aspect of this album certainly is kind of this uh, modern orchestral, uh, slightly uh, expressionistic, experimental approach, uh, which at this point in time was kind of the other side of Zappa that was uh, constantly revealing itself and uh, so yeah so it's an interesting interesting statement this album and quite a pleasant listen so um, now the next album <clears throat> is a huge treat in my book and comes from Germany this is the album Spring Fever by Joachim Kühn now this is a uh, jazz fusion very smooth and kind of laid back and creates a very beautiful atmosphere and then there are very fancy riffs and grooves uh, so uh, it's kind of always switching back and forth between smooth jazz and uh, kind of jazz funk and jazz fusion um, it's basically a, a four piece a quartet uh, with uh, Philip Catherine on guitar and John Lee on uh, bass and Jerry Brown on drums Although, um, on the first track uh, you have 
the legendary Kurt Kress on drums and Zbigniew Seifert on violin, a wonderful violin solo on this first track, Lady Amber is just beautiful. Came out in 1976, uh, like many great things in the 70s, it was recorded in Munich. Um, yeah, and this is a really, uh, at this point in time, one of my favorite uh, kind of fusion or jazz rock albums. Uh, Joachim Kühn, of course, a keyboarder, pianist. Um, yeah, so very high marks for this album. Outstanding record. If you look for some really cool, funky, adventurous fusion, this is it. Sometimes even with a kind of uh, Pink Floyd type of vibe, just with better musicians. Did he really say that? <laughs> Great record, really wonderful. Yeah, um, I've been listening to this album. I think I've shown in one of my previous videos, I've shown some records by Eberhard Schöner. This is uh, one of his earliest works, uh, Meditation. Uh, this is basically a two-track uh, record uh, with some incredible proto-ambient uh, that Eberhard Schöner recorded in Munich in 1973. This was released in 1974, I think on Ariola. And... Um, yeah, this is a it's a wonderful wonderful album, um, very kind of, very proto ambient experimental music, uh, totally out there so to speak, very kind of spiritual and cosmic and uh, great listen. I mean, if you like if you like sort of a proto ambient music and sort of early years spheric experimental slightly esoteric music, then um, this is certainly. A little milestone uh, of that genre. This is a reissue that came out on by Ariola, but I don't know exactly when. I've, but I would think like late seventies. Oh, this this because this album had quite a lot of covers actually that all looked very different. Now the next album had been shown on VC probably quite a lot, um, a milestone of epic proportions. I'm talking about Inventions for, for Electric Guitar by Manuel Göttching. Um, this is uh, actually one of the most interesting achievements in modern music, I think. The idea to use only guitar setups, only a guitar, electric guitar setup to express everything from percussive, from percussive elements to the unavoidable guitar solo. It's uh, quite outstanding. And it's great how Manuel Göttching manages to cover all the necessary frequencies. So we have the experience of a full musical canvas. I mean, if he had used at least a bass guitar, it would not be cheating because it is still an electric guitar of sorts. But that's not the case here. Everything was recorded only with his electric guitar and a lot of effect machines and a lot of... Uh, interesting settings on his amplifier but um, of course this was recorded in 1974 um, in the Roma studios in Berlin within the decline of Ashra Temple and um, so kind of becoming his first solo album that way um, for me this is probably the most important kind of proto-ambient album of all times fascinating fascinating stuff and it's quite exciting how Manuel Göttingen manages to keep you interested and to grab your attention through this entire recording, which is just this one big wave of trance type of music. Um, so yeah, this is very fascinating. But I think a lot has been said about this album and I think it's been generally quite revered. Uh, this is a kind of contemporary reissue that came out uh, in 2016 on MG Art, which I assume is Manuel Göttingen's own label. Um, yeah, so uh, quite quite wonderful. Uh, I've really uh, enjoyed listening to this a lot. Um, I, I don't know if, if you, I don't know if you have noticed that, but I'm such a chimp. I have such a hard time to talk into a camera, and at the same time do anything, like doing two things at the same time. 
impossible for me. So just like taking out the record out of the sleeve and still kind of talking talking over it um, seems impossible to me. So uh, that's when my uh, general expression in terms of language kind of becomes very like a caveman. <clears throat> yeah, um, now let's... Let's stay with the uh, people that uh, get photographed in front of giant gongs. Uh, I've been uh, listening a lot through the catalog of Bill Bruford, uh, particularly his 70s band Bruford. Feels Good to Me was the first album, which uh, is uh, quite astounding, and I really love this album. This is one of my favorite albums, actually. Um, this is certainly my favorite lineup with uh, Alan Holdsworth on guitar, Jeff Berlin on bass, Dave Stewart on keyboards, obviously Bill Bruford on drums, and Annette Peacock on vocals. Outstanding, outstanding. It's a completely progressive and uh, energetic approach to jazz fusion, sometimes somewhat misunderstood, I believe. Um, this is something I've, by the way, read a lot in uh, commentaries, in some uh, kind of a social social media forums uh, where people sometimes point out that they just don't understand why Annette Peacock is kind of destroying these recordings uh, by singing bum notes all the time, which I think is really a stupid remark that... Uh, those people that made it kind of didn't think it through <laughs> because, first of all, just put aside the fact that you are sitting in a studio and in one corner is Jeff Berlin and the other corner, corner is Alan Holdsworth and in the third corner is uh, Dave Stewart with his keyboards and Annette Peacock is recording her vocals and do you think that at any point in time during those weeks in studio, don't you think that Alan Holdsworth would probably look up from his guitar and look over to Bill Bruford and say, well, mind you, Bill, don't you think that uh, Annette is a bit off-key here all the time? I mean, you have, you have like the best best eight ears <laughs> in the business in the same room. Of course she's not. She's amazing. This is one of the biggest vocal achievements I've heard in quite a while. It's just, um, yeah, they're freaking jazz men, so it means they don't make it easy for her. I mean, all the melodies over these songs, the vocal melodies are quite far away from uh, the bass notes of those chords in question. So the way the music is written, this is not a folky song that you play around a campfire. So I would say to all those that criticize the vocals, um, if you understand the principle of Occam's Razor, then uh, let me tell you that if Occam's Razor applies here, then it's much more likely that you as a listener has have just reached the limitations of your musical perception. Uh, it's the most likely explanation compared to the explanation that uh, it's badly sung. So uh, that's all I have to say about it. Uh, feels good to me, a wonderful album by Bruford. Actually, in my book, quite quite a milestone. Um, so uh, their second album was uh, one of a kind. Um, kind of still the same lineup, just uh, without Annette. Uh, so this is a uh, instrumental effort. And some incredible stuff here. I mean, you have uh, tracks like um, One of a Kind, uh, Forever Until Sunday, The Sahara of Snow, Part 1 and Part 2, 5G. Um, so yeah, this is an amazing fusion album, and uh, look with the original Polydor inner sleeve. Haven't seen those much. Yeah, uh, and uh, finally, um, let's have a look at the third album by Bruford, which is uh, gradually going tornado. This came out in 1980. Now the interesting part here is obviously that uh, before this album was released uh, Alan Holdsworth had left the band and was replaced by John Clark 
um, who was somewhat a pupil of Alan Holdsworth. So uh, this, at least, this is how it was some, somehow communicated, probably to um, create the impression that uh, the replacement will not uh, diminish the overall quality of this band, which it certainly doesn't. I mean, I think John Clark plays wonderfully guitar here. Um, it's not a Alan Holdsworth imitation, thankfully, so he brings suddenly a lot of uh, kind of his own uh, style and his own ideas into the mix. And uh, this is certainly not a bad thing. And uh, so you get a little more of uh, kind of vibratos and some kind of a more flashy guitar effects, uh, stuff that uh, Alan Holdsworth always somewhat uh, rejected. And um, and it's it's kind of funny because it's it's kind of it's a famous uh, thing that uh, here on the back of the record where the lineup is listed it says the unknown John Clark. Uh, and this was kind of his uh, his moniker for a while because he was replacing Alan Holdsworth, so it was the unknown John Clark. There are some really good tracks on this album, by the way. Um, Certainly, um, some of the material had, they had already played b b with Holdsworth already before this album was released, uh, particularly Joe Frazier, which is this kind of a furious track by uh, Jeff Berlin. QED is uh, another wonderful uh, recording uh, written by Dave Stewart and Bill Bruford. And probably my favorite track on this album is The Sliding Door. Um, by the way, Jeff Berlin is uh, taking the the vocal duties on this album, which uh, could have been a very bad idea, but actually he does okay. I mean, he's very busy on this record anyway. I mean, the bass playing on this album is quite... This is a bass player's record, I think. So if, you, if you're really uh, looking for an album that is completely insane in terms of bass, um, in the kind of busy furious areas as much as in kind of the calm nuanced moments uh, you f you find both here on this record and uh, Jeff Berlin is just wonderful wonderful on this album so uh, that's uh, gradually gradually going tornado and this was the third and last the uh, Bruford, uh, Bruford uh, studio album now, I have some more stuff here to show you. So the other band I was listening to a bit is the Caldera. This is the album Time and Change. Um, this is a jazz rock uh, outfit that probably is from New York or was from New York. Um, they made most of their records kind of late 70s, early 80s. Um, this is a kind of a Latin type of album with a lot of percussive uh, parts to it and uh, some incredible drumming. Yeah, I think the, the names at the center of the band are mostly Jorge Struns, who is the guitarist, and uh, Eduardo De Barrio, who is the keyboard of the band, but also Steve Tavaglione, who is the flute player. Some really beautiful kind of jazz flute playing here. I really like, I really like flutes in a kind of a jazz environment. So uh, this is a jazz rock or jazz fusion album but uh, certainly not too heavy or heady um, in some parts it is more kind of the vibe of a kind of library record which i don't see as a critique but uh, it's kind of light-hearted and uh, it's a good listen on a sunday afternoon and uh, certainly a type of music that uh, can help you through the lockdown, so to speak. Um, same goes uh, for their other album called Sky Islands. Um, again, the same style, the same vibe, uh, kind of a Latin uh, jazz rock uh, fusion sound. Uh, somewhat psychedelic in some parts. There are some really outstanding guitar solos here, by the way. I mean, there is, there is a lot of shredding. But it never gets too complicated and too intellectual. It's always more about creating a good vibe, good groove and uh, keep a track going. Yeah, so that's Caldera. I believe a band from New York. Um, those albums all came out on K 
Capitol Records. Um, let me put them back in the sleeve. And if that takes too much time, I can still cut it out. So, um, now uh, the final four or five albums I want to show you are all um, kind of in the spirit of of West meets East or East meets West. Let me begin with this wonderful record which is quite outstanding and quite unique. And this is a uh, disco jazz by Rupa. And uh, this is a uh, I think it's an album from Canada that uh, was released um, certainly in the early 80s I think. And uh, let's see if we have some interesting label here that we probably don't see every day, which is here. The Numero label. Yeah, I mean, it's not the greatest pressing in the world, though, but uh, it's kind of fine. Um, this is an interesting music, because uh, this is a very sophisticated kind of jazz rock fusion uh, band uh, put together that is surrounding this uh, Indian singer singing in Hindi and uh, what you get here is a quite an interesting triangle of styles where in one corner you have uh, really genuine disco music in the other corner you have a kind of bona fide jazz fusion sound and uh, in the third corner you have kind of Hindi pop of the early 80s and uh, it's an unusual blend, but it's one. It's a blend that sounds really adventurous and uh, that's great fun to listen. I mean, it's quite amazing. I mean, particularly, there's a track called Ad Shani Bar, which is just amazing. It's the second, uh, the third track on the A side, and uh, the entire side two is uh, just one long, 16-minute-long track that is just pretty cool. And uh, yeah, this is this is really big fun to listen to this album. It's really enjoyable. And the great thing is it's not too much of any of those three things. So um, it's quite a perfectly balanced. And uh, so it never gets annoying, but uh, it always stays exciting. So it's a very cool album. Disco Jazz by Rupa. Now, uh, as far as uh, East meets West goes, uh, this is a bit of a classic uh, late 60s milestone, the Orient Express. So this is like a summit of three guys that came together to record this one album, and this one album only. And uh, it's an interesting mix of, of, of artistic personalities, I think. The one guy is uh, Guy Dury, who is from France and who plays uh, sitar and oud. Uh, the other one is from Belgium, actually a pilot and a musician called Bruno Gier. And uh, the third one is from Iran and it's called Rashid Golesorki, who is a mostly a percussionist and a singer. Um, so uh, what you get is a kind of interesting sound that is uh, to some extent based in folk music, but uh, completely spiced up with all these uh, Middle Eastern elements. It's not a pure Middle Eastern music as much. It's not a pure folk rock, it's somewhere in between and uh, it's uh, in, in parts it's certainly slightly odd or feels a bit kind of left fieldish but um, in itself it's a very unique statement I don't think you easily find a second album in this vein and uh, also uh, if you think about it, I mean this came out in 1969 if I remembered this correctly and in 1969 this album must have really really lent itself to to the entire psychedelic and kind of flower power hippie mentality I mean this was certainly a uh, a disc continuously playing on some people's turntable back in the day I'm pretty sure about that so yeah it's certainly very kind of ganja oriented <laughs> Despite the fact that these three guys certainly don't look the part. Um, so yeah, this is a, certainly a uh, cult album to some people, I think. And uh, I find it quite wonderful and it's very unique. I mean, you don't, you don't hear a record 
like that a lot. Now another East meets West project was Oriental Wind. That is a uh, project or a band from Sweden that again recorded most of their records in the late 70s, maybe early 80s. Um, this was basically a band um, around the Turkish drummer and percussionist Okay Demis, who is quite uh, legendary in Turkey. This is a kind of a household name, and uh, it's a very, it's a very uh, versatile and very experimental drummer. And uh, he kind of surrounded himself here with these four or five uh, Swedish musicians. And uh, what they created is it's kind of a jazz jazz fusion sound that is very Middle Eastern. That is a lot of Middle Eastern percussions. Um, I think a lot of uh, kind of original Ottoman Ottoman tunes are being reworked here into this kind of a jazzy sound, and it works beautifully. I mean, it's an outstanding album. Um, it's probably the only album I have that is completely signed by the entire band, which is usually something I don't uh, pay much attention to. I'm not very autograph oriented. In most cases, I always feel like, why should I ask the artist to to smear his ink over my clean cover of a record? So I don't know. <laughs> I've never done that. I've never asked the musicians to um, sign anything. So I think this album came out in 1983 and it's called Life Road. But I have another album by Orient Wind here which is called Bazaar. This came out two years earlier uh, with a very similar lineup. Uh, again another great example of this uh, interesting uh, combination of uh, sort of genuine, genuine jazz uh, meeting Middle Eastern music. This came out on a label called Sonnet. So, which gives me the opportunity, once I've removed this cat hair here, god damn cats, so this gives me the opportunity um, to show you another label that probably doesn't get shown that often, the sonnet label, the pyramid here. Um, yeah, so um, I really like Oriental Wind. Um, it's very adventurous as far as drumming goes and uh, uh, it has some incredible saxophone playing by Lennart Aberg and um, yeah, um, good bass playing here by Bronislav Suchanek. It's kind of interesting how all these cool jazz bass players all have Polish names. So anyway, the last band I want to show you is the band that I have shown you um, a few times uh, in the past and that's Alten Gün um, and their third album Yol that came out not that long ago. Um, yeah, so uh, <laughs> this was a kind of interesting uh, listen because uh, it certainly subverts the expectations a little bit um, but uh, after a while you kind of start to figure out why that is and why it probably makes sense. Um, so when when I heard their first album on, I thought this like the greatest album of the year. This, I was totally blown away by it and I still stand by this is super interesting effort. And uh, their second album slightly different, but uh, still very exciting. Here I was like, yeah, kind of like it. Um, by but uh, what is it that I do not like? First of all few listens later it kind of started to grow on me so uh, I think this is a really good record. Um, it just took me a while to just kind of get over my own head you know just to detach myself from the sound of the first record um, because it, it seems to me like uh, they are kind of moving through time here um, because the first album on um, it has a rather Kind of psychedelic vibe um, with even elements of kind of surf rock and this in parts very guitar oriented. While the second album seems kind of a moved forward in time and it's much more a kind of a jazz funk album still with a distant echo of this kind of a Anatolian rock 
psychedelic rock vibe, but uh, suddenly introducing a lot of kind of elements of disco. And uh, this here, it's kind of moving another 10 years into the future, so it has a lot of kind of feeling of uh, of uh, 80s synth pop and uh, still kind of a disco-ish uh, vibe going on here. And uh, um, again, I don't think this is a bad album. This is actually a really great album. Um, it probably never will be my favorite one of those three, at least. Um, but I kind of understand because um, Alton Gunn started uh, making music with a kind of a very clear-cut formula. So here's this uh, Amsterdam-based band uh, that is kind of funky in style, but their entire material is the um, kind of a musical archaeology of a particular cultural phenomenon, and that is popular music of the Turkey from the 50s onward into the 80s. So uh, mostly covering areas like uh, Anatolian psychedelic rock, but also kind of the arabesque music and and uh, folk tunes and uh, kind of melodies that oftentimes don't even have a kind of proper composer because they have been around for so long in the streets of Istanbul. So in a strange way, it's a it, they are a cover band, but a cover band that creates these really intricate rearrangements uh, that uh, elevate this music uh, on a very kind of different level. So you always can find tracks here that if you are familiar with the kind of Turkish music of the 60s or 70s uh, that you suddenly recognize again. In particular a track like Yekte, which had been uh, popularized by Alpay. Um, but uh, they oftentimes go back to, to Neshet Ertas and rearrange some of his music. Um, so um, if you have this kind of a formula, the other question is just how do you continue with that without making one album sound exactly like the previous one. So we have to create a, some kind of a trajectory here and to keep kind of develop, developing and refining your style. Otherwise it probably gets boring for you and maybe for the audience. So I'm pretty certain that's what they're doing. Um, they're kind of evolving somewhere. And uh, so uh, while uh, you still have, uh, even with this third album, you still have exactly this kind of a concept of uh, Turkish music being absorbed uh, by this uh, contemporary band from the Netherlands. Um, at the same time, uh, they still develop their style and push the envelope and find their way to do it in different styles. However, I've been blathering for so long that uh, it's probably a good idea to stop right now. So uh, I don't know if you enjoyed this. I doubt that you have spent so much time listening to my blathering all the time. But um, then again, I'm not doing that too often, so um, I guess it's a zero-sum game. You can listen to this one hour long video, um, like once in a month, or you can listen to ten shorter videos by me, but I think it will kind of come out the same way. But it probably will not make much difference. However, um, I hope you are fine, I hope you are great, I hope you are coping well with the overall uh, difficult circumstances and um, keep spinning music, keep listening to music, keep talking about music um, and don't be afraid to write something in my commentary section. Have a nice day, I'm going to hit this bouldering wall of mine. See you!